So I'd like to talk about why the Feldenkrais method is so helpful for self-empowerment. And I also wanna share some specific strategies you can have in mind when you study to make it even more so. You'll notice we've already done in the first lesson some of what I'll talk about, and we'll do more in the next one. So first, I want to share a quote from Moshe Feldenkrais that points to what his method is about. And interestingly, I think this quote came in front of my eyes through an email from Frederick. I think it might, he might have used it in his email signature. My purpose is to allow people to move closer to actually being creatures of free choice, to genuinely reflect individual creativity and emotion, freeing the body of habitual tensions and wired patterns of behavior so that it may respond without inhibition to do what the person wants. As usual with Feldenkrais, that's a mouthful, right? <laughs> so he's looking for us to become more potent and free, more expressive and confident. These are wonderful, empowering goals that he had for his work. Most of us, often we don't feel so free, so uninhibited. It may have been in our lives that at some point we were actually profoundly disempowered by struggles or traumas we experienced. But as long as we're fundamentally safe today, the ways we feel disempowered in the present, they usually have ingredients in our past, in the habits we learned, in habits of self-protection that we built when we actually were not safe. These self-protection habits, they persisted forward in time for most of us into other circumstances in our lives. And maybe that self-protection became part of our identity. These can be habits of how we think about ourselves. They can be emotional patterns like fears or common anxieties, repetitive anxieties. They can be both. Often we get this habitual loop of anxious thoughts and emotions, they feeding off each other and we're stuck, right? We have the feeling, gives us the thought, the thought gives us the feeling and back and forth we go around and around. Because of the nature of our brains, these mental habits are always connected to habits of how we hold our bodies and move them. All this in our bodies, it's like a, a permanent part of the sense of ourselves, like how we protect ourselves in a chaotic world. It really is like our own personal suit of armor, okay? And armor is heavy. You don't want to wear more than you need. If you've ever noticed how Feldenkrais lessons tend to lighten this load, not just physically in our sense of our bodies becoming lighter, but also mentally with how our thoughts and emotions tend to change during a lesson. If you've noticed that, then you're experiencing something amazing about our nervous system. Just by settling deeply into that state of questioning that's part of all Feldenkrais lessons, we're using our brains in a way that is incompatible with maintaining the unnecessary parts of the armor of our habitual self-protection, right? So just by asking questions in this Feldenkrais way, our brain moves to a state that isn't compatible. It's not available in our brain to be under our full weight of self-protection armor. We get freer simply by asking the questions about what we're actually experiencing. When our frontal lobes are full of the pleasant novelty and non-judgmental questions, like we invite them to become in Feldenkrais lessons, we really can't maintain some of those unnecessary defensive. It just inhibits some of the plates of armors. They kind of slide away. So the first strategy I want to call out in using Feldenkrais for self-empowerment is a major ingredient in all Feldenkrais lessons. It's really not unique at all to this workshop. We're always bringing a state of questioning to what we're doing. We're cultivating our curiosity about our actual moment-to-moment -moment experience in a non-judgmental way. And I don't just mean curiosity about our body and movement, which is what you know, comprises so many of the cues that I use, but we can also bring our curiosity to our mental state. For example, even our fears, right? If you think of something that you're commonly afraid of, what does it really feel like in our embodied self when we're not just trying to escape the fear? And so often fears and other negative mental states, we're just trying to get away from them. But interestingly, if we go into our experience, if we meet that mental experience or most unpleasant physical experiences, ones that we'd rather not be having, if we can meet them with honest, simple questions, like what are the details of this feeling in my mind or my body? How does it move or change over time? What else is connected in me to this sensation I get about this feeling? What are the boundaries in my body of this feeling state that I have? 
when we compassionately look into the details of our experience in this way, we're not looking for analytical answers. This is where another place that Feldenkrais lessons are so beautiful. They give us these opportunities to go more deeply than usual into the moment to moment experience we're having. So we don't just stop at, I feel anxious. Instead, we can notice something more concrete, something less conceptual, like our breathing. The breath is an amazing awareness tool. It's used in every Feldenkrais lesson in some way. We don't have to think to experience our breath. It is blessedly non-conceptual. You can choose to experience your breath right now and you can still listen to me. And it's endlessly stimulating because the breath is always moving. Maybe sometimes when the breath doesn't feel so nice, like when we're anxious, but even then, so sometimes it doesn't feel nice, but even then the actual sensations of breathing are often easier to be with and watch with curiosity than whatever difficult thoughts or emotions those breathing feelings are associated with. And if I'm curious about my breath, even to sense resistance in it, or just notice other sensations that might not be pleasant, well, it's amazing. It starts to change pretty soon if I'm just curious. The sensations might become a little more pleasant or just simply different. And difference is interesting in and of itself to our brains if we're listening closely. And then because we're questioning, we are not so bound by our historic habits when we're gently questioning like this. Then through the crazy miracle of how our nervous system works, the thoughts start to change too and the anxiety begins to lighten. It all started when we just turned a feeling of anxiety into a compassionate question. How am I breathing right now? So obviously we're breathing at every moment, but in every experience, there's so much more going on that is like the breath that is non-conceptual. These non-conceptual things are like our anchors, right? Another example is our constant interaction with the ground or the chair we're on. That's raw sensory data. It's not a concept we have to think about to notice. And then there's proprioception. That's the sensory data we get when we move our bodies. Also not conceptual, non-conceptual. <laughs> non-conceptual, if I say that too many times, I'll totally lose it. <laughs> we can turn to these things, these non-conceptual things, anytime we need a little more clarity or certainty about ourselves. So we bring our compassion, our curiosity, our non-judgmental questioning state of mind to the experience we're actually having right now. We practice this strategy all the time in Feldenkrais lessons. And it lifts us up. It's a truly empowering technique in lessons and in life. There's a second strategy I'm gonna talk about and then we're almost done. The second strategy that's particularly useful for self-empowerment is more specific, but it's still part of all Feldenkrais lesson, lessons. And it really is available in every moment. It's noticing and playing with our relationship with the surface that's supporting us in the field of gravity. We did a little bit of this in the first lesson, right? Sometimes it's called grounding or getting grounded, but it can be powerfully helpful at any time because gravity is the most constant force of the universe we experience, right? It's literally been weighing down on us for hundreds of millions of years of evolution, as well as shaping our bodies and minds through the decades of our own lives. And whatever we think we must improve about ourselves, whatever we wanna change, we're already so good at canceling gravity with our skeletons, our muscles, our brains coordinating them, that somehow, miraculously, we are pretty functional under this crushing force of the universe. It is truly a miracle that we know which way is up and that we can lift ourselves off the ground and move enough to meet even just our basic needs. And somehow in this gift of humanity, on top of that, we can dance or play sports or do incredible things with our uprightness. Now, just something about those basic needs, how we kind of get ourselves in trouble. The need to orient ourselves in gravity and the needs to feed ourselves and everything else that's most basic, they're so primary that we will find a way no matter what, unless there's been a massive injury to the system. But a lot of the time, a lot of us are actually answering gravity pretty inefficiently with our skeletons. Right, if, if you think of the ground plus our bones as the equal and opposite to gravity structures, right? Together, the ground and our bones are the reason that we're not plummeting to the center of the earth or falling to the floor. Gravity is always working on us. So if we're inadequate or inaccurate in our skeletal support, then our muscle tone must increase to keep us from falling. This means that we often work too hard with our muscles simply to stay upright as opposed to countering gravity with well-organized bones. 
And then those muscles that are keeping us upright that don't, they aren't designed for that, they're occupied, they're busy resisting gravity. So they're unable to be efficient parts of our actions. So it is literally disempowering, right? We lose muscles that are the engines of our lives. It's disempowering when our relationship with gravity is less skillful than it can be. So we use Feldenkrais lessons to train our ability to cancel gravity, which means our ability to find more and more efficient anti-gravity organization of our bones as we act in the world. If we do this, it frees up a lot of muscle resources and mental resources to do more of what we want. In a way, it's profoundly empowering to, we could call it, to get right with gravity. Now, honestly, all Feldenkrais lessons point at this, but you can make any lesson even more about empowerment by focusing on how the movements of the lesson are experienced with regards to the ground. We did this a lot in the first lesson. We'll do it again in the second lesson. You can promote in your attention the sensory story of this constantly changing relationship with the floor that is created with every single movement you make. So my regular students, you've heard me say things in the past, like in Feldenkrais, we're not moving for the sake of moving. We're moving to produce sensations we can learn from. But we're gonna revise that a tiny bit today. We could say we're moving to produce sensations of interacting with the ground. It's just practice for what we're always doing anyway. And I'd like to put one last even finer point on this, if I may. We, we did this pretty clearly in the first lesson and it's unusual. It may be a new in your Feldenkrais practice, even if you're a regular student. So I wanna spell this out. It is powerfully useful to think not so much about how we push the ground or the chair with our bones and bodies to produce movement, but to change that familiar script a little and think instead of organizing ourselves to lift the clarity and buoyancy of the ground up and through ourselves and into action. So if gravity is the downforce and we know about equal and opposite from our high school physics classes, see what happens when you focus on the opposite of gravity, when you train yourself to hear the up and through from the ground sensations that your body is giving you as you act, instead of focusing on the down and in of gravity. When we listen to ourselves and move like this, there is a kind of elegance. It's like we're interacting with the ground artfully. We can go so far as to say that moving well, functioning well, is a side effect of canceling gravity efficiently. And so as I sit here, even as I'm thinking and talking, my awareness includes the sense not that I'm on this stool, that it's an inert and non-responsive convenience to me, but instead that I can sense how I'm engaged with it actively in such a way that I feel empowered to interact with you, to be here in the world. This kind of active interaction with the support surface, it came up a lot in the first lesson as we explored those heel spirals and how they help us organize our skeleton and actions. And we lifted the heads of our femurs up into our, the backs of our pelvis, into our pelvis and torsos. That's the, the third strategy that I'm mentioning today. It's just, I'd like you to improvise on that lesson sometime or do the replay. That spiraling organization of the skeleton, I think is worth studying and practicing if you'd like to feel more empowered. I find it creates in myself a huge sense of self-reliance, of safety, of authority. It's just a wonderful thing for me. You can bring that actually into other Feldenkrais lessons that are in, you know, back lying, one knee bent, one foot or two knees bent, that kind of situation or anything that you do in standing when you're reflecting on how you're moving, maybe a sports warm up or a very quiet skill that you explore in standing. Think about what you can do spiraling out of those heels. See how it changes whatever lesson or action you're in. And then the very last strategy that we're going to explore is the topic of the next lesson. So I won't say about that much about that now, but again, it's about grounding and we're going to be integrating another kind of movement of your feet and ankles up and through your whole self to connect you more profoundly with the support surface. Sound good? Based on time, I think we should move into that lesson process right now. So uh, you can start to head for your mat. We'll begin in standing. I'm going to stop and restart the recording so people can jump right where they want to in this event. If they're reviewing it or whatever they're doing. <laughs> 